Well, welcome to another How Conversation on Moral Leadership. We have an incredible guest with us today, uh, the former governor of Massachusetts, Deval Patrick. Uh, so, um, Governor, do we still call you Governor? Governor Deval Patrick, uh, welcome back. Uh, we're Thank looking you. forward to this conversation. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Former governor of Massachusetts, Deval Patrick, is an American politician, but he's also a civil rights lawyer, uh, author, as well as a businessman with an incredible background. And I'm going to share a little bit of your background. I'm sure in our conversation, we'll unpack this and add a little bit more to the tapestry of your life and your leadership. Raised by a single mother in the south side of Chicago who moved to Massachusetts as a teenager and earned a scholarship to the prestigious Milton Academy in Massachusetts at eighth grade and the first in your family to attend college and also went to Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Uh, appointed by President Bill Clinton to be the Assistant U.S. Attorney General for Civil Rights in 94, and then General Counsel to many businesses, including Texaco, which later merged with Chevron, and also Coca-Cola. Your governorship, you were elected in 2006, two terms then uh, through to 2015, and the first Black governor of Massachusetts. Uh, briefly ran for president in 2019 and currently is a professor of practice at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Thank you so much, Dana. It's great to be with you. Great to have you here. Let's journey into our conversation now to go back a little bit into your upbringing. Share with us a little bit about your upbringing and the people and experience that shaped who you are today and the leader you have become and maybe even as I know you as a learner and a leader are becoming. Well, to go all the way back, you mentioned that I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and I've talked many times about how at that time in the 50s and, and the 60s, every child was under the jurisdiction of every adult on the block. So, you know, you messed up down the street in front of Ms. Jones, she'd straighten you out as if you were hers and then call home. So you got it two times. What those adults were trying to get across to us was that membership in a community is understanding that you have a stake in your neighbor's dreams and struggles as well as your own. And that lesson in community has been incredibly important to me, more meaningful, frankly, as I have gotten older and as I have taken uh, leadership opportunities, that we are stronger together when we turn to each other rather than on each other. And that's the kind of uh, leader I have tried to be. I think the other lesson is one every one of us gets from our grandparents, right? That we're supposed to do what we can to leave things better for those who come behind us, whatever it is. Um, it doesn't have to be the, you know, the grand gesture. It doesn't have to be the big elected office or anything like that. It has to be, it has to do with how you, not so much what you do, but, but who you are, how you behave. Well, you honor your grandparents and, you know, you share that they're refugees from the Jim Crow South and they really embedded in you how you are inspired to see the humanity in everyone, which is one of the principles of moral leadership. You know, how did that influence your public leadership journey um, through, you know, many avenues, including your co-director role now, but well, uh, certainly. In terms as a governor. First of all, let me just say that you're telling me that I honor my grandparents is one of the nicest things anyone can say. Um, they were extraordinary people who in the 1930s, I think it was, left Kentucky where they had grown up um, and moved to Chicago, as so many people did in the so-called Great Migration, so many Black people did. And I think what I took from my grandfather's way of living was that he saw the dignity in every living soul, everyone. Um, there, it didn't, I mean, even frankly, you know, when we would take our monthly drives over a weekend back down to Louisville to visit um, family, and in those days, you know, you had to bring enough food for the trip and a, uh, a slop jar, if you know what I mean, um, because uh, you didn't know where you could stop to go to the bathroom. Um, even the folks who treated him um, you know, this grown man um, with a lack of dignity, he responded with dignity. And I think in so many ca uh, cases I, I can think of, he seemed to draw that out of other people, that it was, there was power in his example. Um, so, so many different kinds of uh, influences of that, uh, of that kind around the importance of human dignity that, um, 
that I took from him. And then, of course, there were other adults in the neighborhood, Ms. Jones, like I talked about, teachers in the in the schools who loved us and um, helped us raise our expectations of ourselves. Yeah, I want to share another wonderful quote uh, that you have shared publicly. And it's the quote, if you think about the big challenges that face humankind today, some have their roots and shortcomings in leadership. We have people in many senior positions who have thought hard about how to become a leader, but not how to be a leader. How do you become a better leader? Uh, one who's more focused on moral leadership. I think, first of all, in, in the political world, although I don't think these lessons are limited to politics, <clears throat> but in the political world, one of the phenomenons I've, um, I've uh, observed is, uh, is that there are an awful lot of folks who have spent a lot of time thinking about how to be, how to become this or that, not why they should. Um, not not what it is they want to actually accomplish. And uh, there's so much premium placed on, you know, kind of harvesting and storing up your political capital. But if you actually want to do something, you have to spend that political capital. You have to be willing to lose, it seems to me. And I think um, while I honor folks who have made uh, a career of uh, public office, um, particularly elective uh, office, and there are some remarkable people um, in service today who bring a servant leadership approach to it. But I will say, I have to tell you, when you think about the big challenges that face us today, from the climate crisis to loss of confidence in democracy itself, to sectarian and religious and racial division, um, uh, to frankly, you know, I'm a capitalist, to the loss of confidence in capitalism. So many of these challenges have their roots in, as I said, and as you quoted, or are touched by a lack of leadership and unwillingness of the folks who have a chance to reset the tone and the dialogue, to call us to a higher and better place and to work for it, not just to hope for it, but to work for it, as my grandmother would say. Um, there is risk in that, right? There is risk of ridicule. There's risk of of uh, of of you know being overwhelmed by the cynicism that is all around us today. Um, there's risk of failure, being called to that higher place and then not being able to actually achieve it. But when they do, and when they believe the leader believes they have it in them, uh, amazing things happen. What are some uh, pieces of advice to people in those fields of education, business, and elected leaders that you would provide in terms of advancing our shared democracy? Some maybe uh, top top things that they can do and be to advance shared democracy. Well, I think I think I think you start with listening. You know, there's there's a I'm a great believer in grassroots campaigning, um, and and that's that was our. Uh, approach when I ran for governor, um, partly because it was the only way practically to break into a very tight and inward looking political establishment here in Massachusetts, but also because philosophically, I believe um, there are an awful lot of people, as I was saying earlier, who have checked out, who feel left back and left out of their own civic and political future and showing up, not with all the answers, because nobody really has all the answers and no one person, no one party has a corner on all the best ideas, but to ask questions, to, to engage people, there's power in that, right? In, in addition to real information, there is power in inviting people to see their stake in their own um, civic and political uh, future. And I think that's true in business as well. I used to say, you know, I learned um, to some extent how better to manage a large state government having worked in large corporations, um, because you know, if you don't go talk to middle management and get their understanding and influence on the agenda you think you have, uh, that you think you want to drive, and have them refine how to do it, or tell you all the reasons why it was tried a decade ago and didn't work then and won't work now, and why there are other things that are more important, then you just miss the opportunity to get um, real success out of your agenda and the very best out of what uh, 
out of what the led, uh, the followers have to uh, have to offer. I'm going to take us back now, if you don't mind, to 10 years ago in 2013, when you were the governor of Massachusetts and we had the horrific uh, Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that was obviously a, a critical time for your leadership and an aspect of trying to lead <laughs> during crisis uh, and tragedy. So what did you get right looking back? And also, what are some of the things, if you were to do it all again, you know, you might do differently or, or mm -hmm. what you learned leading? during that uh, difficult time? There was some element of kind of stepping into a, a void um, and doing it in a way that was, uh, again, about servant leadership. What do other people need, right? We had, we had the law enforcement folks who were trying to solve the crime. We had the medical community that was trying to save the hundreds of, uh, of life-threatening injured who'd um, who'd made it to hospital and then we had a community that was reeling and afraid um in circumstances where often people will turn on each other rather than to each other right um and it's a natural thing and it happens and so i think trying to um sort out all the different ways we had to respond and assure that we had the right leaders in the room for those lanes and that they felt supported by me. So the question I was always asking is, what do you need? What do you need? How can I help? What can we cut through? And then, you know, I had some great advice from my chief of staff at the time who said, you know, every other emergency you've managed, you have given information to the public, but you've also asked the public to look out for each other, right? To check in during a blizzard on their elderly neighbor or a power outage or some other kind of uh, emergency. And he said, you know, you ought to do that here too. Um, and, uh, and so we started after the very first press conference um, to call out the acts of grace and kindness that people were showing, um, the ways that folks would bring runners into, the, into their homes. Um, uh, when the race was called, who were disoriented and dehydrated and get them water and get them warmed up and explain what was happening and help them get reconnected with their um, families. There were all kinds of acts like that through that whole week that we kept elevating. And as we elevated them, they prompted other people to show those acts of grace. And in fact, I think that has as much or more to do with Boston Strong uh, as uh, uh, as anything else. The uh, culture of kindness, I can share a personal story I, I've shared with you also, where my uh, former executive officer when I was active duty Air Force uh, was killed in Afghanistan and an, in an insider threat situation and uh, was an immigrant from Venezuela. His wife was running in the race that day and was just short of the finish line and had some traumatic experience based on that experience and was uh, swarmed uh, by kindness uh, to help her through that uh, double trauma that mm -hmm. she was experiencing. So I owe that to you and your leadership that you created that environment uh, and difficult. Right. Because uh, being a moral leader during these times where, you know, it's not just doing the next thing right, but doing the next right thing. Oftentimes it's pulling you in two different directions, which is probably why being torn and tired <laughs> is a natural part of being a moral leader. You know, Dana, uh, it's such an interesting thing. I, I've, I've made this point in my class. I think that um, we have a we have a marvelously talented group of students at the Kennedy School who are of a generation that frequently confuses cynicism with sophistication. And they think that there is something incompatible with kindness and generosity and tough-mindedness as a leader, um, mental discipline and having to make the hard choices. And I just don't think that's true. I, I think that there, in fact, I don't think there is such a thing as leadership without ethical uh, um, or moral leadership. There is, it, and it's not the same thing as being righteous, um, but it is about being right. It is about having a true north. It is about struggling with the conflicts that you um, will always find as a leader, as a human being for that matter. 
between the thing you think you need to do that's expeditious or um, seems um, convenient uh, at the time and the right thing over time. And yeah, I love how you phrase that as kindness is sort of, you know, it's part of your centering, you know, when you are being pulled in directions where you're having to decide where somebody's not going to be happy with your decision, but what is your prevailing value? Uh, and, you know, you're affiliated with the Harvard Kennedy School, the Center for Public Leadership co-director, also a great friend of our founder, Dov Seidman, and also the Howe Institute for Society and Moral Leadership. And we talk about effective public or effective moral leaders having a very strong moral courage. I love the word cur because courage is heart. Heart, mm. maybe kindness go together. But there's also this sense of being um, not just having moral courage and strength, but also being humble and recognizing our own uh, vulnerabilities. Right. So how have you integrated the desire to portray strength and expertise and courage uh, along with that desire to maybe listen and ask for help? You know, what's your playbook for how you challenge this, uh, you know, dynamic uh, and and how it is that how, how do you I guess, follow your compass in that um, being strong, but also being humble and and. Vulnerable. I love that question. I love that question because I think humility is uh, is one of the handful of key uh, uh, qualities um, of a successful uh, leadership. And I will say that every of a successful leader, and every time I've gotten in trouble, it's because I've uh, you know I've forgotten myself um, and gotten a little a, a little carried away. I had a great teacher. Uh, at Milton Academy, I think of him every single day, an English teacher named A.O. Smith. You know, he'd ask us to recite a uh, uh, a passage from a poem or a novel that we were studying. And um, if we didn't, um, if we really didn't get it or it was clear we hadn't read it, he would make us stand up in the class and face the class and say, I am ignorant, Mr. Smith. And, you know, it was a small class, but it was still embarrassing for a bunch of 14-year-olds. And, uh, and he explained, he said, you can't learn until you acknowledge what you don't know. Um, and there is power in acknowledging what you don't know. What I have found, he did not say this, but what I have found is that in, in any number of settings, when you acknowledge you don't know, people come right forward to help. You know, they they do step up. It's fabulous. And, you know, we're humans and everybody knows humans are imperfect. And so if we try to project perfection, people look for the chinks in our armor. Well, let's uh, move into the fact that you are devoted to developing principled public leaders at the Center for Public Leadership and with our fellows and the Kennedy School and also uh, invested in the development of next generation leaders and moral leaders here with the Howe Institute for uh, Society. So my question has to do with a piece of additional advice. What would you like to leave for developing moral leaders in the next generation of, of key, maybe some things that you haven't shared yet, or maybe it's re-emphasizing some of the things you've shared in this How Conversation on Moral Leadership, some advice for the next generation, emerging leaders, moral leaders? Well, I, th I think, you know, I taught a course this year, uh, this past spring, um, that uh, one of the uh, newly graduated students helped me design that we called Principles and Politics When Running for Office. And it was not a how-to course. It was more about how to center your why uh, as a would-be um, candidate, really focus on what it is you want to do with this or that uh, elective office and how to come back to that when the sharp elbows of politics uh, come out. And one of the most poignant um, classes in that course was about opposition research and people talking about how uh, this or that in their background um, made them ashamed of, uh, of stepping out and having that thing, whatever it is, uh, be made um, public. And, you know, in a class of 100 people, it's hard to get people to be that intimate. But we 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 had amazing conversations, trusting conversations within parameters we'd set down on the first day of class. And people told all kinds of stories. And I told some of my own. And I said, you know, we're all broken. We're all broken. Um, 
maybe one way to think about your brokenness is to make that a part of your story. Um, because it's not just our leaders who are broken. Um, it's the lead. It's the followers who are broken too. And, it, and, and maybe the healing is something we do together. Maybe that's also an element of our civic life. You do that, I think, we've talked about this, of both mental toughness, um, your, your sense of what's right, and also humility. Because as I said, no, no person, no party has a corner on all the best ideas. And um, so I, I think there is a way to think about principled, effective public leadership. I want conviction. I, I don't want just people who are polling to figure out what they care about, but who allow for surprise, allow for the insight that um, that you get because you made a point of engaging, um, most especially with the people who um, are so often left out and left back and who aren't feeling like they are heard, which it turns out, I think, is most people nowadays. And I'm wondering if we can go back to what I hear from you, and maybe it's some of your grandmother coming through, uh, who you honor, of hope for the best and work for it, I think is what you said that she said to you. So what gives you hope for the future, and, and what are you working towards for that future? Well, I, it, you know, it's, it's, it'll sound a little like a cliche to say that young people give me hope, but I, I have... I remember like everybody else or so many of us being stuck inside or in one place during uh, COVID, which is funny. It was either a couple of years or a decade. It's it's completely messed with time. Um, but uh, after the George Floyd video, that so many people from so many different backgrounds in so many different places in this country and around the world we're out in the streets day after day, overwhelmingly peaceful, um, sort of putting their collective foot down and saying, you know, we don't have to do this the same way um, in, the, in the future. And I think the, the, what was particularly striking, um, in addition just to the breadth of empathy for the, um, for the tragedy we saw, was that it was sustained. And in a place of famously short attention span, um, that I think gave me a tremendous amount of hope because I think that the, the point was not just about how to reimagine uh, this, you know, kind of old fashioned notion of consistent professionalism from the police, um, but the notion that you know actually there is humanity and dignity in everyone um including george floyd and that we can see that and honor that and we can um behave uh accordingly so i'm encouraged i'm encouraged by that i will say i worry too that the um strong conviction we hear from so many of the students at the Kennedy School, for example, which is so um, is so inspiring. I sometimes tease them that they have more certainty than they do actual experience, but that's okay. Um, that they don't always leave room for folks who don't already agree with them. Um, that they aren't they 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 feel some tension, some conflict between the strength of their convictions and their and their curiosity about other people's um, views or how they how other someone else may take the same set of circumstances, the same um, uh, facts, and reach a different uh, conclusion. And I, I worry about that because I think politics is supposed to be about how you manage those differences in a society, how you work those out. And you work those out um, uh, not, in, not, not just through power. I get that part. Um, but you also work those out through persuasion um, and, uh, and the willingness to engage across uh, differences is 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 a worry alongside the hopefulness that um, 
that so many young people are calling on so many of the rest of us, each other and the rest of us, um, to be and do better. We are so grateful from the Howe Institute for Society and for your dedication to developing moral leaders and being an example of moral leadership, recognizing we're not perfect, but we're on this journey and it's really worthwhile. And for creating a wave together with us, uh, we salute you, we honor you, we thank you for the time and the wisdom you've shared with us today. Thank you. So uh, I'm so touched that you would include me. I appreciate it.